In this module, we'll introduce the concept of control. So far in this class, we've addressed two main topics. The first topic was the modeling of dynamic systems, and the second topic was the time response analysis of dynamic systems. In this module, we will begin the third main topic of this course, which is control design. So we'll introduce the concept of control, attempt to give some idea of how we design controllers, and we will also introduce the idea of block diagram reduction, which is a skill that we'll need in designing controllers. So, so far we've modeled dynamic systems and analyzed their time response behavior. Um, we've derived models for mechanical systems, electromechanical systems, and electrical systems. And we've learned how to predict the time response or the output of a system for a given set of initial conditions and a given input. We've also learned about sort of certain canonical systems, first order systems and second order systems, and have created sort of specifications based on the response of these canonical systems to simple inputs. For example, a step input. If it turns out that our system doesn't meet these specifications, uh, it doesn't have the desired response in terms of speed, uh, that is its peak time is too large, or its settle time is too large, or it oscillates too much, uh, its overshoot is too large, then we can attempt to modify the behavior of the system with control. At the very beginning of the course, we learned two basic control architectures for, for achieving this. Uh, the first was open loop or feed forward control. And so at this point, we're going to discuss these architectures again in the context of, of what we've learned so far in the course. So one advantage of this architecture is that the controller is very simple to design. So let's go ahead and take a look at this block diagram um, where we provide the system some reference and what we desire is for the output of the system to match that reference. So if this was a cruise control system and we commanded some speed, then it would be desired that the output match that commanded speed. And it turns out that the design of a controller is quite simple for this case. For example, uh, let's take a look. So for any sort of transfer function, including this controller here, the output is simply equal to the transfer function of the system, C of S, multiplied by the input to the system, which is R of S. If we ignore this disturbance for a second, then this U is going to be the input to our plant, where again the output of the plant is simply equal to the transfer function of the plant times the input, which in this case is U, which is also equal to C times R. And so what we desire is we desire that the output match the reference, i.e. We want the controller times the plant or the process to simply equal one. Therefore, we can design our controller to be the inverse of the plant model. So if C of S is equal to one over P S, then these two will just equal one and our goal of the reference equaling the output would be achieved. So this is very simple. It's cheap in that we can implement it without a sensor. We don't need uh, any feedback. So we have less cost since there's no sensor. There's no software to interact with the sensor. There's no signal processing um, to go with the sensor. Uh, it could be lighter. Uh, it could be uh, more sort of robust in the sense that the sensor can't break. This sort of architecture, however, is less robust in that the performance isn't, isn't as robust. In particular, if we had model error, for example, you know, we designed our controller to invert 
the dynamics of the plant. And so in essence this P of S is our model of the plant. But if the model of the plant is not known very well, or if the model of the plant changes, then our C of S um, you know, will be based on some model, let's say P prime, and when we multiply it by P, we won't get this cancellation. They won't equal one as desired, and so the reference won't approach, so the output won't approach the commanded reference. And examples of this that we've discussed previously were, you know, for an automobile, perhaps the number of passengers changes, perhaps the, uh, the plant changes with age, uh, tires get older, the engine gets older, there's some aftermarket change to the vehicle, etc. The other thing that, that this controller design doesn't take into account is disturbances. So we designed it as if the input to the plant was simply you, but in reality it may include some other input that we don't know or is not desired. So again, going back to the cruise control example, a disturbance could be a wind gust or it could be a change in grade of the, of the road. So one way to address these limitations of an open loop or feed forward controller is to add feedback. We'll discuss that on the next slide. Just before we do that, however, I'd like to call out an element of this block diagram, which we will refer to later, and that's the summing junction. So this block diagram in includes signals, like R and U and Y, and it includes systems, which are these transfer functions, C of S and P of S. And then here we have a summing junction, which represents a summation of two signals. Similarly, we could have a negative sign to, to represent the subtraction of two signals. So by adding feedback, we help to address some of these limitations. In essence, it becomes more robust. So if, for example, our plant model was wrong, or we had some disturbance such that the output did not converge to what we commanded with the reference, by measuring the output, we can see that fact. So if there's an error present, if the reference does not match the output, then our controller can modify its control to try and change that. You know, if the vehicle is heavier than we anticipated, then the controller can change the control output to request more control effort. If there's a wind gust that must be overcome, similarly that will show up in the in the error you know the actual speed will be lower than the commanded speed and this error can then be used to increase the the control effort requested the drawback of this architecture is it's more complicated and expensive it's expen more expensive in the sense that there'll be a sensor and all the sort of attendant aspects that go with that and it can make the, the design of the controller more complicated. So on the previous slide, we were able to design the controller very simply. We basically didn't need any, you know, we needed a 30 second lecture to sort of justify the controller as being designed by inverting the plant. With a closed loop controller, the design of the controller is more complicated and we're basically gonna spend the rest of the semester learning how to do that. It can also make a stable system become unstable. And this is a maybe a little unintuitive, but it turns out you could have a stable controller, i.e. the controller transfer function could have poles all with negative real parts, and the plant could have a transfer function with poles of all negative real parts. But when you close the loop, you could get an unstable system. So even though the components are stable, if you found the transfer function for the entire system, it could be unstable. And again, this is a little unintuitive, um, but maybe one way that you could sort of think about this is uh, imagining pushing your brother on a, on a swing. So the sort of the timing with which you push your brother could, could make him slow down. So 
if you're sort of you know applying your force in order to slow the swing down so you're applying the force sort of when your brother is swinging backwards towards you you can slow him down but if you change the timing with which you're pushing such that you're pushing when the swing is swinging forward you could make your brother swing higher and higher and higher and go unstable and so there's sort of a simple example where just by changing the timing with which you apply your control you could make your system go unstable with a feedback control system the response can also be slower so with an open loop control system if you know the plant perfectly you can sort of apply your control in anticipation of your desired output so for example when I'm driving my car it's a you know it's sort of a compact car it doesn't have a very powerful engine so if I want to pass somebody on the highway what I'll do is while I'm still behind that person I will step on the accelerator before I pull out to pass him so I'll step on the accelerator I'll wait a second then I'll pull out into the lane just as my car is beginning to accelerate so I applied my control in advance of when I actually needed it because I I knew I had an internal model of of my car and I sort of could anticipate that uh, I could anticipate the dynamics so that I could apply the control before I actually needed it with feedback control you can't really do that you sort of rely on on the output so with your feedback control you have to wait for your error to develop before you will increase your control and in that sense your response can be slower because you have to wait for the dynamics of the of the plant there are ways to address that um, with feedback control which we'll discuss but sometimes there can sort of be uh, undesired sort of uh, side effects to, that, to doing that before we move on to to getting more into the design of these control systems I'm going to simply point out another aspect of block diagrams which is the branching point point. and so in a block diagram if you have two signals and you split them uh, the signals uh, are the same so from this branching point going forward this is the output Y and this branch signal is also equal to Y